So the first kind of DE that we're going to learn how to solve is a first order linear differential equation. So we already know what that means. First order says that the highest derivative that we have is first, the first derivative. So we'll have something like a u prime of t or du by dt or dy by dx, and that's, that's the only derivative that we'll have. And then linear says that for each term that we have in our differential equation, that term only has either the function itself that we're interested in, or one of its derivatives, or is possibly just a function of the independent variables. So there are no cross terms, and we don't have anything like ut squared or anything like that. So the most general form that we have for a first order linear equation is this over here. So there's our derivative, there's the function that we're trying to find, and over here we have a term that just involves t. So this, this might actually include many terms. So we might have, for example, cos of t plus t squared, but we lump them all together into the function that only um, depends on t itself and doesn't include anything to do with u. So this is a first order linear DE. There are a few more terms that we use to kind of further differentiate them. So the first is sometimes we have differential equations where this term that only includes the independent variable um, is zero, in which case we call that a homogeneous DE. So for example, we could have dy by dt is equal to uh, 16y of t. So there's a super simple um, homogeneous DE. If we have a term in our independent variable that is non-zero, then we call it non-homogeneous. So for example, dy by dt is equal to cosine of t plus 16y of t. That's a non-homogeneous uh, differential equation. First order, and it's also linear. The next thing that we do is we have a look at the coefficients, so the terms that multiply either the derivatives or the function itself. And if they are constant, we call it a constant coefficient. No surprises, if they're variables, we call them a variable coefficient. So if we look at this one that we've got over here, uh, there's a little hidden one behind our dy by dt. So this is constant coefficient. Um, on the other hand, if we look at this one over here, this is also constant coefficient. Um, but we could construct, for example, dy by dt is equal to cos of t y of t. So this is homogeneous because we don't have a g of t, but our h of t, the term multiplying our, or the factor multiplying our y of t here is variable. Okay. So how do we solve first order linear DEs? Well, the example that we're going to have a look at is one that we've already seen, uh, which was DE we got for our intracochlear drug delivery. So if we have a look at this, this is, this is linear and first order. So our g of t, according to the setup that we've got there, is our c1, and our h of t is minus r over v. So I'm going to talk you through the procedure for, you, for solving these DEs. Um, there are going to be a few steps where it seems like, why would you do that? And the answer is because it works. And we'll talk about why it works afterwards. But let's just get through this. Okay, so the first thing that we need um, is we're going to do a slightly strange thing. We're going to find an antiderivative for our h of t. And it can be any antiderivative. So if we were to integrate this and do, um, proper, do it properly, we'd end up with a plus c, but we're just going to set that c to zero. So we're going to say, uh, let me say, we're going to call big H of t is going to be the integral of h of t dt without the plus c. So if we just do that, we've got that's minus r over v times t. Okay, so this is the first step. So step one is find h of t equal to mm, 
Okay, so we're finding big H of t, which is any antiderivative of little h of t. And for practical purposes, that means just do the integration and get rid of the c, because it's just going to make your life complicated. You could do this with the plus c, um, but you wouldn't want to. Okay, uh, the second thing we're going to do is we're going to rewrite our equation here to bring our h of t, u of t to the left hand side. Okay, so we're going to write this as u prime of t um, and then we're bringing it over so we've got uh, plus r over v u of t is equal to r c1. Okay, so far all seems good. Here's the crazy step. The crazy step says multiply both sides by e to the minus h of t. Okay, and as I say, there's, there's no, this is not obvious, um, but we will see why you do it when we, when we look at this again. Okay, so let's just go ahead and do that. So we're going to multiply both sides by e to the minus h of t. So this is our h, so we're going to multiply by e to the, and we've got a minus times a minus, so we've got an r v of t times u prime of t plus r over v u of t, and this has got to be equal to e to the r over v t times r c1. Okay, so that's, that's our first crazy step. And now we're going to integrate both sides with respect to t. Oh, actually, before that, we're going to notice something very cunning. Uh, so this is this is the magic bit that I completely forgot about. Okay. So the thing to notice. And this is why we multiplied by this crazy integrating factor here, is if you think about the product rule a little bit, so go and remind yourself if you've forgotten, we could actually rewrite this bulky term on the left hand side as d by dt of e to the r v t times u of t. So this is, this is why we multiplied by um, this integrating factor over here is because it allows us to simplify the left hand side using the kind of reverse product rule. So you can check for yourself that if you differentiate this chicken over here using the product rule what you end up with is this bit over here. Okay so we have simplified our left hand side we're not going to do anything to our right hand side and now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply and we're not going to multiply we're going to integrate so we're going to integrate both sides with respect to t so i'm just using joys of modern technology so we're going to integrate with respect to dt, integrate with respect to dt. And now notice with joy and delight, we are going to, on the left hand side, be integrating with respect to t, a derivative with respect to t, which means we're actually not doing anything, we just immediately get the thing in the first place, because integrating the result of a derivative just means that you end up with the thing you started with. On the right hand side we do actually have to do something here, so our r and our c1 are constants, we need to integrate e to the r v t, r and v are constants, so we will end up with v over r e to the r over v t, and we're going to have plus c, where this plus c really includes the plus c that I would have got over here. So I would technically have got a plus c one over there and a plus c2 on the right hand side but i've just kind of i've taken this one over to the right 
and I'm just calling them all, calling the combination plus C. All right, and you'll notice we're almost home and dry because what we want is we want an explicit formula for this U of T. And if we divide through by our integrating factor, we'll be done. So let's just finish up. We've got U of two, T is equal to, so our R's have cancelled there. We're going to divide through by our E to the whatever, whatever, which is going to cancel there. So we've got a C1V plus C times, so we're dividing by E to the R VT, which is the same as multiplying by e to the minus r over v t. So there we go. We just solved our first differential equation that we couldn't have solved using straight integration. At this point it's tempting to just kind of run away and do something else, um, but remember that this did come from a problem that we were working on. Um, we were working on intracochlear delivery. So let's see if this function that we got actually makes sense. So if you think about the scenario that we had, we're going to start introducing drug into the ear. So we have what's called an initial condition, which it tells us the state of the system or what our function value should be at t equals zero. zero. So our initial condition, because there's no drug in the air, and this was and our u of t is measuring the amount of the drug, our initial condition here should be that our drug amount at time t equals zero should be zero. So we can use this condition to work out what this integrating constant here should be. So if we substitute that in, we'll get uh, 0 is equal to C1V plus C, and then e to the, that's e to the 0, which is just 1. So this tells us that our big C is going to be equal to minus C1V. So our function u of t is equal to c1v1 minus e to the minus r over vt. Okay, which, I mean, it looks kind of pretty, but the question that you might ask is, does, it, does that function actually look like the kind of thing I want? Uh, and the easiest way to do that is just to plot it. So let's plot it. I'll move to GeoGebra. Uh, and just to keep life simple, I'm going to say let's let c1 be equal to v, be equal to r, be equal to 1, just for ease of plotting, because that should at least tell us the right sort of shape. Uh, so let's head over to GeoGebra, and I actually prepared one earlier for us, so you'll see that um, we've got, I'm plotting the graph of 1 minus e to the x, which is, uh, sorry, 1 minus e to the minus x, and if you have a look at what we've got, this is almost exactly what we want for our function to model our drug delivery. So let's pull that back in. So if you think about what we wanted, we want something which starts from zero, which ours does, gradually increases and then sort of seems to reach a sort of a plateau. So this kind of is, is the, the goal of this course, is not the crazy techniques that we use, but the fact that we put together a very simple model for intracochlear ear delivery, which is a really complicated thing, and we use the simplest possible model, and yet we put together something that actually, when you work it out, gives us a, a solution that would be a sensible place to start thinking about the problem. Um, so, so don't get caught up in the techniques here. What you're wanting to take out of this course is where they can take you. So they can take you to actually finding kind of a model that's actually not bad. I mean, if it was super simple, that kind of, that looks right. Okay, so if you are someone who works well with kind of lists of instructions, I've given you the instructions here for solving first order linear. Um, it, it follows exactly what we did in the previous slide. And I suppose the challenge question is, um, why, why would you multiply both sides by this crazy integrating factor?
And the answer is really because what you're looking for, you want to be able to do this step where you simplify the left hand side down into a derivative like this so that you don't actually have to do any integration. Notice that over here we didn't integrate anything. We just realized that we were taking the integral of a derivative. So we moved on with our lives. And that's what you want to be able to do. So really what you're doing in these two steps is you want to find some f of x, which when you multiply it by, or when you multiply u of t plus, so sorry, this was minus h of t, u of t. So we, we want to find this f of x so that when you multiply our derivative minus u of t h of t, which is this bit over here, what you end up with is something which is d by dt of f of t u of t. So thinking about what this function has to be, if you spend a little bit of time, you'll see that it has to be this crazy thing over here, which was e to the minus the integral of our little h of t. And that's and it's just due to the product rule. So this is product rule. Uh, so if you feel like it, give that a go. Um, otherwise, you can take it on faith. Um, and here are the steps. So here's a challenge for you. I will put the solutions in the final version of the notes, but I'm not going to go through this in the lecture. Um, you can use what we've just learned to solve crime. Yay! Okay, so police arrive at the scene of a murder at 12 a.m. Um, they take a record of the body's temperature, which is 32 degrees Celsius, and by the time they finish processing the crime scene, it's 1.30, so an hour and a half's gone by, and just before they move the body, they take the body temperature again, and it's now 30.6 degrees Celsius. Uh, it turns out that the crime scene has stayed at a toasty 28 degrees Celsius poll time, so what the police want to know is, when was the person murdered? You can use Newton's law of cooling, which says that the rate of heat loss is proportional to the difference between the temperature of the body and the temperature of the environment. So often when you're solving problems, you don't get given the equation. You need to figure out what equation it is. Um, how could we write this down? So Newton's law of cooling states that the rate of heat loss, so the rate of change of temperature of a body is proportional to the difference between the temperature of the body and the temperature of the environment. Okay, so we've got a rate of heat loss. So let's call T the temperature of the body. And this is telling us that the rate of heat loss, so the rate of change, D big T by dt, is proportional to the difference between the temperature of the body and the temperature of the environment. So it's proportional to the temperature of the body minus the temperature of the environment. Okay, so far so good. So we can turn this proportional, or this proportional, um, this proportionality into an equation by just including constant. So we know that d by dt must be equal to kt minus dn. And if you have a quick look at this, um, you can convince yourself that this is first order linear, but you'll need to do a little bit of tweaking. And because it's first order linear, you know how to solve it. Uh, so you should go ahead and do that. And then when you've finished that, you can come back and we will learn the second magic technique. Uh, that we're learning today for solving differential equations.